Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here and uh, talk about one of my favorite topics, which is uh, research on stories. And uh, why do people love stories? Why it matters? Uh, some of the needs and motivations that are met and some of the outcomes they can have that can make a, hopefully a positive difference. I'll talk today about, um, I often use the term narrative. Uh, narratives are basically a kind of a more generic term for stories. Yeah. Uh, narratives may uh, also be things we don't, don't often think of as stories per se, such as uh, someone's blog post where they talk about something that happened to them personally. Uh, it's kind of a narrative. And uh, I also want to emphasize that I'm, I'm just trying to uh, provide a broad overview uh, of work that I've been involved with on this topic, uh, get some ideas and possibilities perhaps fielded, uh, not to try to do anything uh, you know, detailed or technical in terms of presenting the, the theory you know, or the research itself. So to give you some context, um, kind of goes back a ways. Uh, and before my graduate work, I was I was uh, involved with um, poetry and theater, and was kind of interested in in writing from that perspective, and then uh, as well as in some social change kind of activity. And uh, in my master's program, I became interested. I was very interested in international development, development in uh, less industrialized countries. Uh, and uh, in particular, the use of uh, what they call telenovelas, um, which were sort of extended so far up their narratives to influence things like family planning and, and so on. So I, I wrote a master thesis on that and then went on to my PhD. I, I, I remained very interested in both sort of, sort of uh, ways to use media in pro-social ways and also how media shaped people's beliefs about the social world. Uh, my dissertation concept was uh, based on a, a, a widely held understanding that you know, media is most influential when we don't really know much about a topic or and haven't had much direct experience. Uh, maybe you've had the experience of seeing some media about events where you participated or things you know a lot about and you kind of go, yeah, I'm not so sure what the media is saying here, but uh, when it's something you know nothing about, a place, a, a people, a situation, it's a tendency that you really have to kind of accept what you see in the media, but you don't really have much else to go on. Um, and I, in my dissertation, I, I, I thought we could take that a step further, but it seemed to me that uh, fiction, you know, content that we're saying to people is made up, it's invented. Well, that too uh, can impact beliefs, and perhaps just as much as not fiction, if we don't have any base of knowledge, nothing in our experience or information to compare it against. So in my dissertation, I, I, I found four, four texts about different social groups, and I manipulated them uh, to either refer to a familiar group or an unfamiliar group. You know, by you know, referring to the place and changing some of the names. But otherwise, even the story just gets the same. So example, I might have a story about a family uh, in some Appalachian community. And then I change the names a bit and they'd suddenly be a um, story about a family in the Ural Mountains of Russia. Uh, and then I take a version of each of those and label it as fiction and nonfiction. And that for four different four different messages and had a bunch of people read, to read them and respond to various beliefs about social groups. And what happened was, well, <clears throat> I love that we'd be talking about it. it. It worked out much as I expected that if the story was labeled fiction, and we and it was about the obscure group, to say the you know, the family of the Euro Mountains. Um, 
it influenced beliefs about the people as much as the nonfiction message did. However, if it was, if it was just uh, uh, the names were changed, so it seemed to be about people in the Appalachian Mountains, families in the Appalachian Mountains, uh, the nonfiction label did influence beliefs. The fiction label did not to the same extent or lesser, you know, to a lesser extent. So uh, the discounting that we might do of something that's, that we say is not true, well, it turns out we really only can do that when we have some basis of knowledge to compare it against. So that, I thought, I was very intrigued by that, the notion that we really do depend on, on uh, media content. It doesn't really matter how true it is if we, if we have to depend on it. Um, so um, that was my start in that area. Uh, I, I was interested in particular in the possibility of Patrick Stewart's for social good and especially in health, where I did a lot of work of various kinds. And so I, I started doing some theory development in that area. And I started with something <clears throat> called the Extended Elaboration Likelihood Model, or EELL. Uh, if you're at all familiar, by the way, with uh, social psychology, there's a very well-known um, scholar here at Ohio State named Richard Petty, who is something called the extended, I'm sorry, it's the elaboration likelihood model, ELM, and it's about how people respond to fiction. And uh, I mean, how people respond to um, persuasive messages that are explicit. I said about fiction. So what I was trying to do was extend it to things like, well, how to respond to, to influential content that might be in a fiction story. Um, so I asked what the extended DLM. I was trying to extend it from traditional persuasion of content to, to things like um, effects of, of, of fiction stories. And as I mentioned, uh, these kind of serial dramas, telenovelas kind of things, are actually an important tool internationally in terms of communicating about family planning, needs prevention, uh, and so on. So I was trying to get a better handle on, on how and why these things might work. So the basic argument of the model goes something like this. You know, what happens if counter-attitudinal content is embedded in the narrative? Now, what do I mean by that? Well, an example uh, is, um, Family, you know, we kind of a soap opera about family life in villages in Turkey that was shown in Turkey. But in it, you know, there, Turkey, particularly at the time, particularly in rural villages, was not very friendly towards family planning. And so the show is really talking about how family planning could be very, really consistent in a Islamic culture in rural Turkish culture, and ways in which uh, women could talk to their husbands about it. Uh, but it was part of the story, so it wasn't like, hey, you know, we're doing, that, we're doing a story here to try to persuade you to, to look into family planning. So it was embedded into the story. You know, you, you hear about, about Ali and, and Noor, you know, and, 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 their, and their marriage, and how, and how these, you know, the problems they had supported their family, and how this came up, and how they deal with it. So this technique is widely known as entertainment education. Um, another example that I, I often use in classes is Chacha, which is a, a drama from South Africa that was very popular there. It was a beautifully executed program. Uh, look at AIDS testing, you know, and had the story of uh, a young man whose mother was dying of AIDS and was kind of ostracized, but he was a terrific dancer, big dancing contest, and a popular, well, really well thought of girl in town, with all the other best dancers, they wanted to work together, her family was against it. Turns out that she's exposed to AIDS, needs to get tested, and the shame and the stigma, not wanting to tell anybody, and, and how this all resolves and changes, winds up changing attitudes in, in the community as a whole, both about stigma and about testing. So it's a very, very powerful story and also a very entertaining one. So the basic argument that I was making in the EALM 
was that stories disrupt counter-arguing. Now, I mentioned uh, Richard Petty's extent, uh, elaboration likelihood model. And the basic idea in the elaboration likelihood model is that the way we resist the effect of a persuasive message is we just, while we're listening to it, we generate cognitive agreements. I'm trying to persuade you that you all should uh, give up social media and um, typewriters and, and do, do everything in your life uh, writing long games and uh, sending snail mail. Okay. And you're going to, as I am, have all my wonderful arguments uh, to make, you're going to be generating all these reasons why I'm full of it. Uh, and all the reasons why I have my arguments don't make sense and all the things I'm not, not understanding or paying attention to. And so it becomes very easy not to be persuaded by the message. And, and his argument, that's basically how we deal with uh, persuasive messaging that we don't pick on to be persuaded by. Um, but the argument I was making is, well, you know, our goal in entertainment is to have good times, to be absorbed, to be wrapped up in a story. Now, if it's a good story, we're willing to put up with a lot, you know, uh, even if it's something, you know, think of something that's, that shows you why. You may not really actually agree with the moral values of, of uh, some of the people who are uh, creating havoc in the story world, but uh, a great story. You're not, you're not going to argue about it while you're watching it. Uh, because when you do it, we kind of ruin the story. Your mind's going to that. I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. It's wrong. You, you, you lose it. Uh, you're just involved in the story world. And it's also, for example, the more you're involved with the characters, the more you're involved with the whole situation, the less likely you are to want to do that. You just want to, you're viewing the world for one thing from the point of view of the characters, not from your own point of view. So why should you generate karma against your own point of view? And, you know, I've got a kind of, this is sort of a typical box and arrow model trying to lay out the ideas, but uh, we won't go through that. That's a typical what these things look like. But the bottom line is that there you know, has been quite a bit of evidence by now that, yeah, you know, a story is likely to reduce counter-arguing uh, compared to a conventionally persuasive message. Uh, if it's well integrated in the story, people are about with it and so on. So, you know, that 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 was that was fun and that, that's been a lot of people have done work that have picked up on those ideas. Uh, and I've done a lot of work I'm uh, doing a lot of work on other things for many years. Then in, in, in recent years I kind of came back to research on stories. I've been doing a lot of that in the last seven or eight years. And, and one of the ideas that I, I got involved with is this idea about uh, what I call temporarily expanded boundaries of the self, or key box for short. Now, what's this about? Now, as I said, you know, for I've been interested in narratives for a long time, but you know, more recently, I've been interested in some like more basic questions about stories or narrative. You know, why do we? as people love stories so much. I mean, I was an anthropology major as an undergraduate. And so I said a lot of different cultures. And there's not a culture that, in a world, as far as I know, where stories don't play an important part. Sitting around the campfire, you know, listening to the elders, shooting the breeze, what, what have you. Uh, they're just a, they're, they're fundamental to the human society and human culture. And, why? What, what underlying needs do they meet? And I don't think there's any one simple or short, there's many reasons, many answers. It's, it's, it's too rich a topic to have one simple um, explanation. But uh, I thought I had some you know, insights that, 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 were, that for me were interesting as to um, some reasons that might be um, not obvious. And then, you know, in social science, we, tend, we often like to look at things that may be at least not obvious at the beginning, although many times you're done, you said, it starts feeling pretty obvious. So I came up with this, with, with these colleagues who I mentioned here, this TBOTS model. 
and trying to understand the appeal of narrative. And because narratives can be really appealing, even when they're yucky, you know, even when the stories are depressing, upsetting. You know, you've watched movies or shows that's kind of like, ooh, kind of rough stuff to watch, but it's still a great story, right? A great movie, a great show. Um, and so the approach we took was based on um, thinking about basic human needs. You know, why do people want to do something? Well, what, are, what are people's basic needs? And how might that link to story viewing? And one of my favorite models for looking at uh, human needs and drives is something called self-determination theory. Because, it, it, you know, it, to deal with something as complicated as, as human needs, uh, in, in research, you need to find some, some simplifying framework to work with. And, and this is one I like because it, it really emphasizes three major areas of needs. I <clears> need <throat> different terms for them. Agency, you know, comp, which you can also think of as competence, ability to make things happen. Now, autonomy, the ability to have control over your life, to be able to make some choices, uh, some freedom. Or, and affiliatedness, a relationship, connection. You know, these are everybody, or I, virtually everybody, has these needs to some extent. You know, we vary, of course, in which are most important to us and which matter more to us at different times in our life. Uh, but they all tend to be things that are just intrinsically part of being human. And self determination theory also says. You know, <clears throat> to the extent to which these needs are unmet, we, <clears throat> we tend to feel some distress or dissatisfaction. Now, we came up with a kind of a depressing insight. Yeah, don't, don't you love depressing insights? But here's, here's our depressing insight. Basically, if that's really what we're after, it's being you know, is, is the fullest expression possible of our autonomy, of our relationship capacity, and of our competence or agency, we're got a problem. We got a problem because we can never perfectly meet these needs. We're just an individual person in one lifetime. I mean, even if we're, our life is a roaring success, you know, by, by, by any normal standard. You know, if you have a great profession, you know, wonderful family and marriage and friends, and uh, you, know, you know, enough uh, money and time to be able to make, you know, uh, a lot of your own choices in life insofar as anyone can, things are constrained. You know, if, you, if you're successful, if you're a successful uh, doctor or lawyer or professor or business person or artist, you've had to give up other things to do that. You know, you can't do everything the way you might have dreamed. You know, almost everybody, even successful, has left some dreams behind. Um, relationships, you may have quite satisfying relationships, but the relationships you've chosen preclude other relationships. Freedom and autonomy. We know life circumstances constrain us. But even beyond that, we can only be who we are. I can't ever truly, I can listen to you and try to understand. I can't experience you and I can't experience all sorts of people who are different than me. I can't experience directly what's happened in, in, in times past, times future, in place, parts of the world I'll never visit. Um, so the, being an individual, individual is, is quite limiting under the best of circumstances. And few of us are constantly experiencing the best of circumstances. Usually one or more of these is, is given us fits, right? Well, you know, this is not a set of problems we normally step back and say, I'm imperfectly meeting all of my three you know, drives here. Uh, because I'm an individual human being. I mean, being an individual human being, it we, we, it's, comes to the territory. But I would argue, if you step back and think about it, 
so much of what human experience and activity is, is trying, is trying to cope with this. You know, that there's limitations on our subjective experiences of self. For example, you know, substance use, drugs, alcohol, a lot of that is just trying to get out from under those constrained feelings of, of who we are. Romance and sexuality, you know, the kind of sense of expansion of with somebody else uh, for however longer briefly that experience sustains. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, often the ugliest versions are ideology and fanaticism. You know, I get it. we, our, 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 our little in-group here of, uh, of uh, haters, you know, being part of that makes me feel like I'm part of something special. I'm bigger than just the individual. I'm part of something larger and so many um, movements that have been unfortunate, as well as some very good movements, have, you know, have that quality. Uh, creative expression, aesthetic experience. That also takes us beyond that sense of expanding who we can be and what we can feel. Religion, certainly. Mysticism, I mean, that's, that's precisely what it's about, is trying to transcend that individuality to this kind of more universal kind of experience. Well, stories. Stories are obviously a um, not so dramatic <laughs> choice, but it's certainly more accessible, right? You know, you don't have to you know, go to a bar or, you know, find a, find a partner or you join a, join a fringe group or become, you know, an artist or a monk to try to get an expanded sense of self. You can just flip on a, the screen or pick up a book. So, you know, one way of saying it is that one of the attractions of, 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 of stories, being immersed in the story, is, is maintaining the ontological self. And what do I mean by ontological self? It means the feeling of being. I can feel like I am, even if I, like, you know, change hats, okay? I, I am this, and now I'm, I'm, I'm you, know, you know, out in uh, Chicago or, or whatever. Um, you can you change personas, change experiences, but you still feel like you are, but you are these different things. That's one of the magic of stories. You are, you can be in these different worlds. They can be, um, you know, kind of fantasy ones of being a superhero that they're very popular, try to be, expand our capacities literally, uh, but also they can be, uh, you can have stories of being autistic, you know, a movie, like, um, well, a couple of well with the Rain Man or so on. And it, understanding different kinds of experience, how in color, you know, uh, deaf and blind. But to have a sense of that experience does expand our understanding of who we are. It's a temporary expansion of different, different places, real or imagined uh, times, right? and historically. You know, you're all things we can enter in the story world. Okay, so that's, you know, a lot of ideas, but again, I'm in the social science business. Uh, we want to know, so what? And can you test it? And what can you predict that we can test? Well, one issue, one possibility, and it goes back to my interest in, in people's perception about groups is, well, if you're identifying with someone in a story who's normally an outgroup member, somebody who might stigmatize. Shouldn't it reduce our stigmatization, reduce that perception they're an outgroup member? Well, that's actually exactly what we tested, uh, grad student, former grad students of mine and I, at the movie called Sherry Baby. Yeah, it's pretty old by now. But it was a movie about a single mom who had struggles with drug addiction. And one version we edited to leave out all the drug stuff and one kept it in. 
and what we found was that people who got into the story of the woman, you know, with the woman with it, in the version of her as, as an addict, as, as a person with addiction um, problems, uh, were, might, were, were said they were you know, more willing to socially deal with somebody who, who might be an addict, who had, might be dealing with addiction. You know, the idea of, you know, someone in, work, you know, in your workplace who might be struggling with addiction issues, more accepting of it and less stigmatizing. So that was consistent with the uh, arguments that we made. Um, we also um, made the argument that if there's a need to expand one's sense of self, one's sort of identity, then it's like to be, we have like more of a need when our sense of identity is kind of constrained, is depleted, you know, is stressed or threatened. So I question of how to do that. And uh, one approach, I, I didn't want to, you know, actually threaten you know people identity by telling them terrible people things about themselves, which mm -hmm. people do in research sometimes, but I didn't quite have ever I never made the stomach to, to do that even in the study. But uh, another approach that something that uh, Benjamin Johnson and David E. Wilson thought of was uh, according to a psychologist named Roy Baumeister that just when we are wear ourselves out, our, you know, our, our, our energy for our self is depleted. And we use one of the tasks he uses in studies to do this. It was a horribly boring task. It's like you get a, a, kind of a thick single space page and it's like a counting textbook. And you gotta like cross out all the E's unless the word has a, a C in it. And, you know, stuff like that. You know, just really annoying tiring task, takes a lot of focus. And then we'd show them one of six stories, some of them upbeat, some of them depressing. And what happened was it didn't matter if the story was upbeat or depressing. They weren't just trying to make themselves feel better. Any kind of story, they just like more after doing this task than people who didn't have this task. So it, it, it was, you know, that was consistent with our, our predictions, but Still, yeah, well, maybe, okay, it's restorative. Well, it's a way of relaxing. And what it, you know, maybe all, all my explanations are, are just overkill for that kind of phenomenon. Can we test the idea more directly? Well, another form of grad student had a, had a wonderful idea. He said, uh, well, how about self-affirmation? Self-affirmation actually reinforces the, the concept of self. So if your theory is right, should the opposite also be true? If people feel better about themselves, they should enjoy stories less? Well, um, you can test that. There is a fairly simple way to affirm self experimentally. It has some, uh, a typical way of doing it would be something like, uh, uh, you know, write down two or three, you know, write down one or you know, two, one or two values that are really important to you, and then says, "Well, take one of those values and think of a time that you really lived out that value, really expressed that value, what you did, and not write it down. You know, write down just that, what you did, what it felt like, how you felt. Well, when people do that, they usually come out feeling better about themselves as people." And so we did that. And we found this. And then after then, they, they, they read these stories. People who went to do that enjoyed the stories less and people didn't. Okay, again, pretty consistent with the model. So I, you know, we, were, we were kind of pleased about, about what this sort of said about some of the basic needs that stories meet. But it was a little unsatisfying because I am interested in, in sort of pro-social effects. And this is just sort of general why people love stories. You know, aren't there some stories that matter more, that the expansion of self that one creates in those stories is a more meaningful expansion, that it matters more. It should, or hopefully should matter more. And that's what we explored in our next 
line of research. Um, I'm a fan of some work by uh, a wonderful scholar named Mary Beth Oliver, who uh, very interested in why people turn to stories that she calls eudaimonic, kind of Aristotle's work on narrative, kind of eudaimonia, where the, the stories that are meaningful, as against hedonic and just pleasurable stories that that, 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 that touch us, that move us, uh, even though they may be less fun <clears throat> sometimes. So I, I, I was really interested in how can people, how might people be impacted by these kind of stories? So I contacted Mary Beth and she was interested in working out with me and we also invited him, <clears throat> a colleague from Germany, Marcus Appel. Yeah, who works a lot on narrative also. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we developed a model we call a mediated wisdom of experience. And this follows some work <clears throat> some by some colleges just on how life experience matures us, changes our values. Well, we thought, well, if life experience does that, what about these meaningful eudaimonic stories that tend to show big swaths of life, right? Uh, grief, and loss, and joy, and sorrow, and, you know, the, the mixed bag of life. You know? Um, and, you know, these things really, they are mixed complex emotions. We have more of a sense of the arc of life and how where we are now, we're just part of the story of where we will be over the course of our lives. And things that happen may have meaning with respect to who we are and who we're becoming. And uh, in fact, that's a perspective that tends to be a characteristic, you know, for these psychologists of, of greater personal maturity. So we're arguing that perhaps even the vicariously experience these things in stories could give rise to more mature responses. Well, oh, that's kind of a nice idea, but how do you, you know, our social scientists want to test their ideas. Not good. It's not enough to have a good idea because it turns out, you know, more often than that, your good idea is wrong, or at least mostly wrong or partly wrong. So how do you test it? And so how do you test maturity, you know, or temporary impact on maturity anyway? Well, we did look at the literature and there is, um, indicator of maturity in literature known as delayed discounting. That's the ability to postpone immediate reward in return for a greater later reward. The more mature, more mature people are better able to do this. You know, you are better able to do it as, as, as you age. Uh, but even I think people the same age, when you test it, people who are able to do that tend to be more successful in life, more able to deal with problems and challenges more resilient and so on. So we took some video clips that Mary Beth found online, YouTube clips, advertisements and news shows. We got four different ones uh, and that, that were meaningful and four that were very similar, that were less so as comparisons. And to show, you know, randomly assign people to see one or, or, or the other. I think I'll give you an example. Uh, my favorite of the meaningfully demonic ones was because it was a news um, feature you know, from TV News. Uh, it's a human interest story about a junior high school football team uh, where the they recruited as the manager, the guy who hands out the towels, you know, and the water bottle. Development disabled kid who'd been mainstreamed into their school, who'd been, who was like totally isolated, and only one to deal with this kid. Uh, who was, you know, just not, <clears throat> not intellectually developed the way other kids were. And um, they, they, they brought him onto the team as a manager, and, you know, he, and they kept really like him. He was a really sweet kid. And they had a, a broad idea that they would. Um, they were a good football team, and they were, they, they, and then playing a team, they knew they were <clears throat> going to probably beat pretty badly. And 
And toward the end of the game, they, you know, had the ball on the, uh, like the, you know, the one yard line and, and a few downs to go. And they, without having to tell the coach or anybody else, they had, went and got this kid into a football uniform. And they snuck him out in the field and they called to play and they kind of jammed the ball into, into, into his, in his bip and told him to hold on. And they essentially got out around him and, uh, and carried him across the line, basically. Um, and uh, he, you know, he took off the helmet and everybody in the stand saw how it was. People kind of went nuts. It was wonderful for the kid. People started, you know, really uh, treating the kid very differently in school. And uh, it was, that was all very sweet, but it was really powerful where some of the kids on the team saying, you know, we, we just did this kind of as a joke. But it's kind of changed us because we just had no idea that we could make this kind of difference. So it's really powerful, actually. And the uh, comparison was another news story about like high school, junior high school, high school football. And it was in Texas where there was a, a terrible drought in some community and they couldn't water the field and it was like concrete and they had to cancel the football season for this team. You know, that's very meaningful if you're from Texas, uh, apparently, but you know, it was not, didn't, didn't really compare to the other one for most of us. And what we found, in fact, the people who were randomly assigned to the meaningful narrative increased their willingness to postpone reward. And again, the way we test that, I don't think I made that clear, is you'd ask questions like, would you rather have $50, $50 right now, or would you take $55 in two weeks? Would you take $35 now, or $35 in th three weeks? That kind of thing. Uh, and people were more willing to take the delay reward after the demonic narrative. Again, consistent with sort of stimulating some of these more mature responses, even with just a, like a minute or two clips. So we did this, uh, you know, with a, a more um, uh, traditional entertainment stimuli, taking a number of movies that were, and that had eudaimonic content, and we've got Stand By Me, Up, and Shawshank Redemption. And we took like the relatively meaningful clip and one that was more like, like an action clip. Like if you have been in your, hopefully you may prep some of you have seen Shawshank Redemption about this guy <clears throat> uh, who's, you know, in prison and uh, trying to maintain his humanity in prison. And at one point he sneaks in the warden's office and puts on, he loves opera, he puts on an opera record and puts it over the prison PA system. And it's, you know, plays over the, 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 the prison year everybody is, and it's this sort of this moment of beauty in this really grim place. And it's, it's really a lovely scene. And the other scenes where he's escaping from jail, it's a great action scene, but not especially you know, it. So it's kind of conservative. It's same movie, same actors, even the uh, action scenes are, you know, do have some, you know, emotional values and power. And we also look at a few other variables too. And what we found is, yes, it, and, and it was just like before, it increased people's willingness to postpone rewards after viewing. It also increased some responses to measures of acceptance of death. There was some work by a colleague, Deanna Rieger, um, who suggested this, but uh, this helped confirm that you know, anything this could actually increase people's statements in terms of their ability to deal with the notion that, yeah, I'm going to die sometime. And part of the influence happened because people felt more connected to who, who they would be later in life. There's a more sense of the arc of their life. So, you know, I think this is kind of a very interesting way of thinking about human needs. I mean, it goes well beyond the sort of self-determination self theory issues of uh, agency and autonomy and affiliation. Talk about, you know, how, how do we get, develop a meaningful sense of who we are as human beings? 
uh, and how life experience and our, and plays into that. And uh, it seems to me that uh, we engage in stories in part to, to meet the, that need. And we don't become objectively in some ways wiser or more mature as a result. So it underscores for me <clears throat> the profoundly valuable role and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the importance of the role that stories can have in our experience as human beings. Well, uh, as I say, I, I have an interest in where things are going um, in terms of how these kind of phenomena can impact uh, people in positive in, in sort of more applied ways and uh, like I, you know dealing with identity threats. So I'm interested in I've talked for example with Dana Rieger about working on this narrative with immigrants in, in Germany and you know and the identity threats and how does it help you deal with identity threat. Uh, disability would be a, a possible place to look at this. Uh, I'm working on it currently with some graduate students uh, here at Ohio State on the area of chronic uh, terminal illness and particular uh, willingness to have uh, end of life conversations and do end of life planning. Very difficult thing for many people to confront. And can these kind of narratives help people come to terms with that a bit and be better able to uh, engage in conversations? So that's, that's one of the things we're working on uh, currently. Well, that's what I have for you today. Uh, thanks for your attention. And if you've got comments or questions that we don't have time to get to today or you don't feel comfortable bringing up, um, here's my email. You're, you're welcome to uh, shoot me a line. Thanks for your attention. Look forward to uh, questions you may have.